A thunder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle! And friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wave to the people! Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph! The Steve John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle! I know, but that's hard to spell. Sure, there's always room for one more. return to dear old Abominable Manor, where last time Boris Badenov made a startling discovery. You mean I don't got to kill Moose? Of course not. We'll still get the million pound note if we can take a picture of him outside the house. Yes, according to the will, he must not leave Abominable Manor for one week. The week was almost up, but so was Bullwinkle's dander. I tell you, Rock, if I don't get some air, I'll go stale. Better not, Bullwinkle. With that, Rocky left to take a nap. That's when Boris came in. Boy, oh boy, he's last quarter with only two seconds left to play, and we behind six points. Never fear, Knut. I shall score us a touchdown. Good, Moose. Here, take pigskin and go over goal line. But the goal line Boris referred to was outside Abominable Manor, where Natasha waited with a camera. I take picture of Moose, suitable for framing, and job is done. Bullwinkle set sail for the open door, and it looked like the end, but only of our last episode, for the commotion downstairs had arrested the attention of our staunch hero. Stop! Bullwinkle, you're heading for the door. But the game had to be won, and Bullwinkle plummeted onward. That's when Rocky took off from the balcony and pulled a triple reverse, taking the football away, tripping Bullwinkle, who got only as far as the welcome mat, and scoring the deciding touchdown. We won! We won! Well, Boris, all I got was photo of flying squirrel. You got off easy, Natasha. I bet on other team. I got bad idea. You mean good idea. You know me, I don't got nothing good. Here is Les Ditch plan. That night, on the roof of Abominable Manor, Boris and Natasha burned the midnight oil. And when daylight finally dawned... Well, how do you like it? It's beautiful. What is it? It's rocket ship. Moose will follow Squirrel anywhere, right? It's plausible. So, we get Squirrel inside rocket, Moose follows, we send rocket to moon, no more Squirrel, no more Moose, no more failure. Boris, you are Dracula of cartoon industry. The day passed by, as days often will do, and that evening over dinner... You know what day this is, Bullwinkle? Guy Fox Day? No, it's your last day inside Abominable Manor. He ain't kidding. When the clock strikes midnight, the lawyer will arrive with your million-pound note. You'll be rich. Not if Boris can help it. Here is dessert, gentlemen. Nice hot soup. A butler? Where did you come from? And what's with soup for dessert? I usually get salad. Fair enough. You get salad, squirrel gets soup. But that's no ordinary soup. It contains knockout drops. Say, this is pretty good. How's your salad? Well, the Tomain lettuce is a trifle wilted. I said, how about that? He's asleep. With a butler showing the way, Bullwinkle carried Rocky to the threshold of the rocket ship. That's a very odd bedroom there. Is Lady Steen. Go ahead, take Squirrel inside. And once inside, Boris quickly slammed the door. <laughs> the fools fell for it. Quick, Boris. Pull lever and blast Rocket off. It's almost midnight. 
Yes, the clock was just beginning to strike, and there, coming up the walk, was the crankcase lawyer. Full lever, darling. What you waiting for? I got strange feeling something is going to happen. Something did. The rocket door suddenly opened. Sleep tight, Ross. Hey, where do you think you're going? Well, I haven't finished my salad. Now what? Now this. Will the rocket blast off? Don't miss. The scheme misfires, or you can plan it better than that. Ready, Rock? You sure you know how to work that thing? No. Anyways, here's what it was supposed to look like. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But that trick never works. This time for sure. Presto! Well, I'm getting close. And now it's time for another special feature. You all remember the story of Beauty and the Beast, how a beautiful girl fell in love with a beast and by her love changed him into a handsome prince. You may even remember that they got married and they lived happily ever after, for a while anyway. But what you may not remember is that they had a little boy named, uh, oh dear, dear, a uh, Fletcher. Prince Fletcher. Oh yes, yes, of course, yes, Prince Fletcher. Prince Fletcher grew into a handsome man, but he wasn't happy just being handsome. I want to be famous, like Daddy. Alas, being the son of a great man, uh, 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 don't tell me, uh, Fletcher, of course. Fletcher could never get any respect for himself. He tried being a soldier. Once more into the breach, dear friend. By the way, old man, how's your father? He tried being a lover. My darling, ask anything of me, and it's yours. Good. Can I have your father's autograph? He even tried disguising himself and doing good deeds. Take this gold, my dear man. Hey, you kid, where's your pop? Prince uh, uh, Fletcher became so sad that he went to the court counselor mm. for advice. Why can't I be famous like Daddy? Because, my boy, he was in a book. To be a public figure, you need to have a book written about you. Oh, is that all? Well, I'll see some writer chap immediately. And within a few minutes, Prince Fletcher arrived at the office of a writer named Scrivener. Sordid J. Scrivener. Hmm. Uh, I'm the prince. Yeah, I met your father once. I want you to write a book about me. An exciting book. Right, okay. Now tell me about your personal struggle. Struggle? Sure. Look, like this one. Twenty years a jewel thief. Written by a man who is now admired and respected by those about him. Really? Sure, the other prisoners love him. And here's one about a guy who used to smuggle in Scotch terriers. I call it Hot Dog. Uh, but I never had a struggle. Well, how about your near-fatal illness, like this one here? How to have months for fun and profit? I've never been sick. Hmm. Ever been threatened by danger, like the hero of The Monster and Me? Well, I was once scratched by a pusscat. Nah, it'd never sell to the movies. Isn't there anything you can write about me? Let's see, uh... Hey, I got it! Now, look, uh, uh... Fletcher. Prince Fletcher. Yeah, well, Fletch... How about you being a beast that turns into a handsome prince? We'll call the book, uh, we'll call it The Beast in Me, or Like Father, Like Son. Well... It's my best offer. Done. Right. Now, let's hurry. Us freelance people got to have a quick turnover. And in a few moments, Prince Fletcher and his writer stood before a little hut in the woods. Winona Witch, magic spells, and peanut butter cookies. Oh, that's right, dearie. I put in a sideline. Well, Winona, we're here to do business. Good. How many boxes? Boxes? We need a magic spell. Oh. We want you should turn this, uh, uh... Prince. Prince Fletcher. Yeah, yeah, Fletcher. Into a beast. Didn't I know your father? Get on with it. Very well. Uh, beast. Uh, oh, yes. A boogly, boogly, dear well, that's better. Here, fella, take a look at yourself. My, 
And could I borrow your comb? No time now. We gotta get started on your story. First, you gotta act like a beast. How's that? I don't know. You scared a couple of people. Here, try your luck on these old ladies. Very well. Uh, pardon me, ladies, but boo. You <laughs> oh, 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 wow. Oh. Wonderful, wonderful. What a reaction. Great. All right, what's all this? Oh, a beast, eh? Well, I'm not really. You see, Move I'm... along, move along. Ow, ow! What a story. The whole world hates you, and yet you fight on. Must I? Then the best part of the story, you return to your castle, your own guards attack you. It's a beast! Oh, boy, it'll sell a million copies. Lower the drawbridge! And now it's time for the last chapter, the return to normal and the happy ending. Oh, good. But... Just then, the writer's servant appeared with a message for him. What? Oh, you'll have to excuse me. Uh, 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 Fletch, yeah. Yeah, Fletch. I got a new assignment. A gal named Riding Hood. Boy, what a story she's got. But what about my last chapter? Here's my pen. Write it yourself. But I can't write. And so, poor Beast was left alone with no one to do his life story. There was just one thing to do. Go back to the witch and be changed into a prince again. And so he did. But wait. Wait. Well, here. What are you doing? It's my new job. Advertising manager for Winona Witch Cookies. But if you stay a beast, you'll be a loathsome monster. Everybody will hate you. Of course. But just think. They'll all remember my name. Eee! It's the beast! Now, you see what I mean? I'm so pleased. <laughs> Sports fans, time to... Hmm, wrong script. Hello, poetry lovers. Time for another bout with the bards. Today featuring that famous recipe in rhyme, pat a cake <clears throat> pat a cake pat a cake baker's man. Bake Hold me... it, Bullwinkle. What's up? That's a chocolate cream cake you got. So? You know what happens when you pat a chocolate cream cake? No, what happens? That happens. It's sort of flat, don't it? Now what? Well, the recipe says I roll it and pat it and mark it with a B and put it in the oven for baby and me. You're going to give that to a baby? What's a pat of cake taste like, Brock? Mmm. Sort of like chocolate cream pizza. Yeah. Well. Hi there, sports fans. Time to... <laughs> And now it's time... Time for that jolly juggler, Bullwinkle. Oh, dear. Three at once. One, two... And now here's a feature you're sure to like. Three. style worn by Canadian criminals in the early 1900s. And here is where that hairstyle was first introduced, behind the stark gray walls of Eleavenworth Prison. Well, Warden, we found another one. You're kidding. Take a look out that window. There in the center of the main yard sat a submarine. That makes the fourth this month. You gotta put a stop to it, Warden. You gotta catch the cons who are... Why? Burn it like we did the others. But although the guards drenched the sub with kerosene, it would not ignite. Strike a match and see if that'll do it. This, too, proved futile. And no wonder this particular sub was constructed of asbestos. They given up, boss. They're gonna let it sit there. Good. Now all we have to do is wait for the monsoon season. The yard will fill up with water. We'll climb inside the sub and float out over the wall. <laughs> The man who just said that is Snidely Whiplash. He may claim the only man to ever escape this foul edifice broke out in a rash. Well, Whiplash will show them. Quick, Rollo, to the workbench. We must construct a torpedo. The warden knew that something was up when the submarine did not go away, so he promptly put in a collect call to the nearest mounted police post. And I'm sure Inspector Fenwick would like to hear all about it. He's taking a bath right now, but you hold on and I'll... 
Phone call for you, Inspector. Oh, drat. Just as I was about to sink the Lusitania. Give it to me, do right. The Mountie who almost electrocuted his commanding officer is our dauntless hero, Dudley do -Right. Your bathwater must be tepid, sir. You turned blue for a second. Do right, you're a blithering blather sky. Why, Inspector, I'm shocked. You're shocked? Here, take this phone call and tell me what he wants. I've got a naval engagement on my head. It took Dudley three hours to get all the information. A submarine in the prison yard, eh? Sir, you mentioned that a Mountie acting undercover could get into the prison and expose the whole thing. Sir? I know just the man. Who? You. Me? Yes, you have experience behind you, sir. Besides, it's my turn to use the tub. As usual, Dudley was wrong. It was his horse's turn. So our hero left for Leavenworth, and in less time than it takes to tell, was in conference with the warden. Well, I must admit, Constable, your plan is brilliant. Of course it is. I shall pretend I am a criminal and share his cell. What about your uniform? Won't he suspect? Suspect what? You're right. Good hunting, do right. Oh, I'm not going hunting, warding. I'm just going into... Good luck, do right. Under escort, Dudley went to cell 506 and took his place next to Whiplash and Rollo. Good afternoon, fellow cons. Gag. Unless my beady eyes have gone back on me, that is a creature named do right. I must make sure. <clears throat> uh, what did they send you up for, stranger? Uh, uh pickpocketing, sir. You might say I, <laughs> I'm up for grabs. That's do right, and we must get rid of him. Hand me the torpedo. But before Whiplash could strike, the skies blackened and a torrential downpour cascaded into the prison. It's the monsoon, Chief. We can lay him out of here. Using Dudley as a battering ram, Whiplash smashed through the wall. In the immortal words of Frank McHugh, anger's away! You take the torpedo, Rollo, whilst I exterminate Lorna Doon here. You can't exterminate me, Whiplash, but I have gone stir-crazy. It was true, most men felt the effects of prison life after years of servitude, but Dudley was not most men. I am Lorna Doon. Whiplash, Rollo, the torpedo, and Dudley waded through the knee-deep waters and got aboard the sub. You in the sub. Come ashore or we'll open fire. They seen us, boss. Curse it. For another minute and we'd be over the wall. Lorna. Yes, Skipper? Fire a torpedo through the main gate. Dudley was not himself. Dudley was never himself, or else he would never have done what he did. He's putting the torpedo in backwards. No one's that dumb. The torpedo was fired into the submarine. That's when the highest-ranking officer in the Canadian Navy stepped into the yard. It's Admiral Dewey Dare. What's going on in here? We've just put down a prison break. Prison break? This is a submarine base, and you've just destroyed our biggest sub. I thought this was Leavenworth Prison. Leavenworth was condemned 30 years ago. The warden got 20 years for subversive activities. He, Whiplash, Rollo, and Dudley all shared the same cell. But they weren't alone. What are you doing here, Inspector? I got 10 years for sinking the Lusitania. What about my horse? He's on probation. While our adventure in England is rapidly approaching a dismal climax, Bullwinkle, you'll recall, had to spend one week inside Abominable Manor or forfeit a million-pound note inheritance. But Boris got other plans. Yes, the dastardly villain built a do-it-himself rocket ship. It looks nice, but what's it for? It's for heroes. All we got to do is lure Squirrel inside. Moose follows, we slam door, send boat to moon. It looked like the plan couldn't fail. Thus, at dinner that evening... Eat your soup, Rock, or it'll get hot. Unfortunately, that soup contained an overdose of knockout drops. Two sips later... Poor Rock. He's all Tommy tuckered out. Following Boris's untimely suggestion, Bullwinkle carried Rocky upstairs into what he thought was a bedroom. But what was in reality the rocket ship? Listen, strike is clocking 12. Lawyer is due here any episode. And soon as I pull lever, Moose and Squirrel are on their way to Moon. Pleasant dreams, Rock. Boris, Moose is getting out. No, he's getting in. And just as we closed, Boris prepared to launch our boys skyward. Here goes something. What gives with rocket? I don't know. It should blast off. But it couldn't. Not with Bullwinkle leaning against the brake. 
Moose, would you please not lean against break? Yes, you're spoiling plan. I wasn't leaning against the break. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm not. He's right, Boris. What do you mean, he's right? He's leaning against break. Too darn much noise in here. With that, Bullwinkle picked up Rocky and exited the rocket. Naturally, with a break release, the rocket took off. He was not. He was. The front door opened just as the clock struck 12. Those were the longest 12 chimes I ever heard. Ah, oh, the Earl of Crankcase. Oh, what's going on, Bullwinkle? Glad you woke up. It's the end of the story. You get the girl, I get the money. There's just one thing. I must take one more look at your foot to check the Rue Britannia inscription. Then I get the million-pound note, right? Precisely. You can imagine everyone's surprised to see that the inscription was no longer there. Bullwinkle, it's gone. Well, sure it's gone. It never lasts more than a week. And Bullwinkle told them how, after he took a shower, he stepped onto his bath mat made by the Rue Britannia Bath Mat Company, Peoria, Illinois. You mean the printing came off on your foot? Yeah, cheap mats. But this means you're not the Earl of Crankies. Yes, and it also means that we get the inheritance. They did get it, and it was a million-pound note, a million-pound promissory note. Good heavens, according to this, our dear uncle borrowed one million pounds from the Bank of England. Yes, and you chaps must pay it back. What bitter irony. Filcher, Boucher, and Jay were forced to work in a local garage, draining, of all things, crankies. Cheer up, chaps. At a pound a week, we'll have it paid off in a million weeks. As for Boris and Natasha, they were last seen orbiting along the Milky Way. I tell you, Moose was not leaning on break. You may be right. Rocky and Bowwinkle booked passage on the first boat leaving for home. Boy, am I glad that's over. And you know something? I'd just rather be plain old me than all the earls in the world. Sure was funny how that bath mat inscription fooled us. Yeah, but what's funnier is the one on my other foot. That one never comes off. See? Oh, no! Be with us next time for further adventures of Rocky the Flying Squirrel! Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Hmm. Mine must be a little slow. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Oop.